Well, thank you very much, Derek, for that warm welcome. It's great to be here at the National Library of Australia. Let me acknowledge uh, Brett Mason, the Chair in Mary Louise, as the uh, Director General. Uh, can I acknowledge Professor Chander, our distinguished international guest? Uh, of course, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging? And can I say what an important and increasingly in top, uh, important topic copyright is? And I want today to touch on the Morrison government's agenda in the copyright space and seek to put it in a slightly broader context. So I want to argue firstly that in the last 30 years, as we've seen a transition from an analogue to a digital world, copyright matters more than ever. Secondly, I want to touch on a couple of the challenges that this transformation presents for policy making in the copyright space. And then thirdly, I want to touch on our policy agenda, what we've done, where we're going as we seek to respond to some of those policy challenges. But to start then with the proposition that copyright matters more than ever in the digital age, and I should note parenthetically that one of the great liberating joys of being a politician rather than I was for many years as a telecommunications executive is that I can give speeches without having to use PowerPoint slides. <laughs> and so that's what I'll be doing this morning. Uh, but let me uh, touch firstly, of course, on the way that the whole concept of copyright emerged out of an extraordinary, for its time, an extraordinary change in technology, the arrival of the printing press in the 15th century, which made books cheap, relatively, widely accessible, easily affordable. The 1710 Statute of Anne vested copyright in the author of a book and broke the monopoly control of the stationers over the printing of books and book trade. Of course, technology has continued to develop over the last five or 600 years and copyright has needed to evolve. We've seen the revolution in mass entertainment that began well over a, a hundred years ago with movies, uh, radio and then television. It was great just the other week, in fact, to go to uh, the screening in Sydney of a uh, more than 100-year-old movie that the National Film and Sound Archives had recreated or restored, um, filmed around Woolloomooloo in Sydney in, um, uh, you know, more, slightly over 100 years ago. Um, but uh, they'd done a fabulous job on the restoration. But it's a reminder of the way that uh, entertainment products and the market has changed and copyright law has needed to come up with that. What we've also seen very significantly, of course, is new ways to record, store, copy and communicate content from tape recorders and photocopiers through to computers and portable devices of all kinds connected to the internet. Leading cases such as Morehouse, of course, all about people using the photocopier in the University of New South Wales in the 1970s, I think it was. Um, that was essentially responding to a new technology, the photocopier, and what were, what were its implications for the law of copyright. Well, I think there are several reasons why we can say that copyright matters more than ever in a digital age. The first is the global growth in demand for literary, artistic, musical, creative content linked to increased levels of education, increased levels of literacy, increased levels of income all around the world. Global literacy rates, for example, have risen from around 67% of the world population in 1980 to around 86% in 2018. More literate people means more people who are interested in uh, buying books or reading printed material and indeed uh, interested in using devices. So the combination of rising incomes, growing global population, as well as higher education levels, higher literacy, means many more people can read, can use a digital device, can afford to buy books, music and movie tickets, both physically and their, um, their digital variants. And of course, more and more people can afford subscriptions to online services. In turn, this is boosting the scale of economic activity based on content and in turn, therefore, increasing the importance of the intangible rights which are protected by the copyright framework. So partly in response to these factors, these demand factors, this drive in demand for content, and partly for other reasons, we're seeing a big growth 
in the cultural and creative sector. In the Australian economy, uh, the cultural and creative sector was worth over 6.4% of GDP in 2016-17. That's more than $111 billion. And if we just look at some of the sub-components of that sector and where those numbers are expected to be this year, 2020, cinema, $1.4 billion, broadcast TV and home video, $3.5 billion, books, $2.3 billion, music, radio and podcast, $3.2 billion. These are substantial segments of our economy extensive employment, extensive investment, and they depend upon a robust copyright regime where investors can be confident of getting a return. And so for this uh, second reason, this growth in the sector, the Copyright Act 1968, so now over 50 years old, a critically important piece of economic policy architecture underpinning investment and jobs in the cultural and creative sector. Well now, a third reason why copyright matters more than ever is the extraordinary internet-driven transformation of every sector of our economy. In other words, copyright would be more important thanks to the growth in literacy, the growth in incomes, even if we hadn't had this remarkable digital transformation. But it is absolutely supercharging the importance of content and the importance of copyright because the digitisation of our entire economy, the ubiquity of the internet, has driven profound changes in the way that we create and consume copyright material. Uh, and of course, a very important factor for us here in Australia is the extraordinary increase in accessibility to global content that the internet has brought us. It's not so long ago that Australians had to wait months or longer before books published in London or New York were available here. It's not so long ago that we waited before popular TV series were screened in Australia. All of that has changed and that's an extraordinary global transformation that the internet has created. But of course it's created challenges uh, for the copyright framework. Just think about some of the indicators of this transformation that the internet, that the digitisation of our economy has brought. In 2016-17, 86% of Australian households had broadband internet, internet access. That's up from 56% in 2004-05. The average household in Australia has more than six internet connected devices. In fact, I remember a few years ago as part of a parliamentary committee looking at online safety for children. We were in Townsville, I think, and a mum who came along to that commu community forum said, I feel like the chief information officer of my household, <laughs> just trying to make sure that you know, the devices are all charged overnight. And she talked about how irate her children would get you know, if their mobile phone hadn't been properly charged overnight. And somehow that was mum's responsibility, by the way. Um, Video on demand, practically non-existent just a decade ago in the Australian market alone will have an estimated worth of almost $2 billion in 2020. And that explosion in subscription video on demand is such a big factor. Just four years ago, less than 2% of Australian households had a subscription video on demand service. It's now around 57% of households. And in fact, one of, the, one of the, uh, the factoids I like to quote on this is the monthly downloads that households are now carrying out over the national broadband network. So on the fixed and fixed wireless parts of the national broadband network, the average monthly download is 255 gigabytes a month. Just 10 years ago, the equivalent number on fixed line services across Australia was 11 gigabytes a month. So in 10 years, we've gone from 11 to 255 and that number keeps exploding and that of course is overwhelmingly streaming video. Netflix, Stan, YouTube and all the other ways in which content is being delivered through streaming video including a lot of educational content and indeed the ubiquity of internet infrastructure is providing new opportunities for segments like uh, sectors like online education. There's more than a thousand online education providers in Australia generating around 3.3 billion 
a year in revenue. I've talked a lot about video, but uh, also streaming audio. 46% of Australian adults had a music streaming service such as Spotify or Apple Music. I'm sorry, had used a streaming, video, um, a streaming audio service such as Spotify or Apple Music in the last seven days, and that's up from 37% in 2017. I think one of the things that we can draw out of the recent history, particularly in the streaming music sector, is that when people can purchase content easily and legally online, the evidence shows that the amount of content purchased grows. Um, as we all know, the music industry saw huge disruption and a great deal of copyright theft as people flocked to download music through peer-to-peer -peer and torrent pirate websites. But more recently, lawful music streaming services have surged in popularity and the industry has identified a price point which has had the effect of discouraging piracy. In Australia, total music industry revenue in 2020 will be around $1.7 billion and almost 40% of that is from music subscription services such as Spotify, Apple and Google. Uh, and as the industry peak body ARIA pointed out, commenting on sales figures a year or so ago, that was the fourth year in a row that the Australian recorded music business had seen revenue growth after quite a few years of steady decline. And of course, as the recorded music sector has consolidated this new business model, uh, what in turn that has provided is new opportunities for artists to distribute their music and to be discovered. The income of Australian artists who distribute their music online is nearly double that of those who do not. Well, having spoken about the magnitude of change, let me touch, if I could, on a couple of issues this presents as we set copyright policy in Australia. And these are challenges that governments everywhere are facing. The first issue I want to mention is the impact of globalisation and the fact that a huge amount of content consumed by Australians is generated by huge global digital platforms. The ACCC's recent digital platforms inquiry found that every month 19.2 million Australians use Google, 17.3 million use Facebook, 17.6 million watch YouTube, owned by Google, and 11.2 million access Instagram, owned by Facebook. This presents real and practical challenges. How do Australian rights holders enforce the infringement of their rights when overwhelmingly they need to deal with these giant global platforms to do so? Of course, we've built on our successful website blocking laws to provide incentives for search engines like Google to work hand in hand with copyright owners to prevent access to infringing websites. It also brings into sharper focus key differences in legal principles such as fair use compared to fair dealing. It's perfectly understandable that global businesses would prefer to operate under consistent laws all around the world. But at the same time, the Australian government will always insist on the right to make laws in relation to copyright as in every other area, which in our judgment best advance the interests of the Australian people. Governments everywhere have a strong interest in copyright settings which protect and incentivise innovation and investment, but of course, governments also want to encourage the dissemination of ideas and information to spur further innovation. And the balance which is struck will tend to vary from country to country, influenced by such factors as whether the country is a net importer or exporter of content. And that brings me to a second important consideration, which is how to balance the threats and the opportunities that the new technology brings. Digital technology, as we've discussed, allows content to be quickly and cheaply generated, accessed, copied and distributed. This brings significant social and economic opportunities. It's enabled new business models with products and services being provided in more affordable and flexible ways. It's given our creative and cultural sector an efficient, low-cost way to distribute and promote their works. And platforms like YouTube, Spotify and TikTok allow emerging artists to take their work to consumers around the world. Uh, for example, DJ Flume, uh, known to his parents as Harley Stretton, a Grammy and ARIA award-winning artist born in Sydney, who in 2006, at the age of 15, while still a student at Mossman High, uh, started making music in his bedroom and sharing it on the then very uh, topical MySpace. So the internet has made it possible for artists like Flume to connect to audiences and to... Uh, uh, get their content out there in a way that was not 
possible previously. From a consumer perspective, as Australians, as I've touched on, it means we can now access an enormous amount of content online, music, movies, books, and, and the benefit for all of us uh, has been very significant. For those in regional and remote Australia, it's been profound. Digital access also of great importance for institutions like libraries, including this one, the National Library, museums, galleries and archives, because of the, the, uh, the way that they democratise access to information. It's great spending lots of taxpayers' money on wonderful institutions here in Canberra, arrayed along the lake. That's lovely for the privileged minority of us who are able to get here on a regular basis. But what's very exciting is the way that the work that's stored in this institution and the other national collecting institutions can now be widely available to Australians and indeed others online. Uh, the National Library's Trove, for example, is a wonderful resource, a digitised library of newspapers and other content available to anyone connected to the internet. And as part of last year's budget, uh, we announced funding of $10 million over four years for the National Library's new digitisation program, Treasured Voices. And that's seed funding for the continued digitisation of this institution's collection, the $1.5 billion collection, to make it available online. One of the other initiatives that the digital world has enabled is the National E-Deposit Scheme, which collects, preserves and provides nationwide access to the digital documentary heritage of Australia and it's an efficient electronic means to deposit publications to the benefit of publishers, libraries and, uh, most importantly, users of content in Australia and globally. So for all these reasons, our government has delivered a range of reforms designed to support access to copyright materials online for socially useful purposes. But of course, that same digital technology also allows for copyright infringement with a speed and efficiency we've never seen before. Digital devices are the modern equivalent, the modern version of the printing press that I referred to earlier, albeit one that fits in your pocket. So the great policy challenge with copyright, or one of them, <laughs> is striking the right balance between these competing considerations. Very often, an individual policy measure which is proposed will, on the one hand, restrict infringing uses of copyright, but on the other hand, constrain potential innovative uses of content, which creates potentially new economic opportunities. Now, these competing considerations apply to policymakers in every country, but as I've uh, referred to a couple of times in a country like Australia with a small population where we're net importers of content, we also need to think about the right copyright settings to encourage content generation in Australia and that is so for both economic and social and cultural policy reasons. Well, let me turn then to the Morrison government's policy agenda in copyright, a key plank in our work to support our creative and cultural sectors. Over the last few years, we've made a number of significant changes. Uh, in 2017, uh, reforms to the Copyright Act gave greater flexibility to the disability, education and library and archive sectors. These provisions have removed some barriers to using new technology. For example, for those with a disability, being able to get a copy of a book in a format that can be read by a screen reading program. We've given the education sector a simpler licensing model which gives both educational institutions and copyright collecting societies more flexibility in developing agreements to use copyright material in the digital environment. And libraries, archives and key cultural institutions can now deal more effectively with items of historical and cultural significance to Australia that are in their collections. Of course, cultural institutions can now uh, make digital preservation copies of copyright material in a version or form that's in line with current best practice to ensure it's available for future generations. And importantly, by setting a term of protection for unpublished materials, this free, has freed up large collections of historically and culturally valuable materials held in our cultural institutions for digitisation and communication. We built on that with further changes to the Copyright Act in 2018 to extend the Copyright Safe Harbour Scheme to the education, cultural and disability sectors these sectors can now confidently provide essential online services to their students and to their users rather than worrying unnecessarily about the risk of legal action for copyright infringement by users of their systems. And the scheme, which incorporates a notice and takedown mechanism, 
also benefits copyright owners by giving them quicker and less costly, a quicker and less costly avenue for the removal of online infringing material as compared to going through the courts. Now, there remains a series of further issues which we are continuing to examine. These emerge from the 2016 inquiry conducted by the Productivity Commission into Australia's intellectual property system and include such matters as flexible exceptions, contracting out of exceptions and access to orphan works. My department has undertaken a significant amount of work on these issues and consulted extensively with stakeholders. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly in this space, stakeholders hold rather polarised views. Some argue for a more flexible approach, including a US-style fair use approach. I am concerned that such an approach would bring greater ambiguity or uncertainty. It would impose additional time and cost burdens on both users and copyright owners and lead to either increased litigation or alternatively risk averse behaviour by users with the result that the content is not used. So in my view there's a better case for more specific and targeted reforms. My department has given me advice which I'm considering and I do hope to be able to say more on this in coming months. Some of these issues were canvassed in last year's ACCC digital platforms inquiry which looked at the effect that digital search engines, social media platforms and other digital content aggregation platforms are having on competition in the media and the advertising services markets. I think that inquiry usefully highlighted a couple of things. Firstly, copyright owners require certainty in the enforcement of their rights online and secondly, the risk that broad flexible exceptions could discourage Australian creators from generating premium content in an environment where creative content can be exploited by digital platforms for commercial gain. Our government remains strongly committed to further work with stakeholders on practical options to reduce the availability of infringing material on digital platforms. We did not, however, as would be widely understood, we did not accept the ACCC's proposal to develop a mandatory takedown code managed by the Australian Communications and Media Authority to achieve this goal. And in not accepting that proposal, we were influenced by the concerns of both major copyright owners and users and the potential un unintended uh, uh, effects of a code across a diverse copyright market. But we, we, uh, I should say we also remain committed to reviewing uh, copyright enforcement reforms and I expect this review to kick off in late 2020 at the same time as we begin work to look at reviewing the 2018 website blocking scheme reforms. I should also highlight uh, the work underway at the moment being led by the ACCC to agree a code between the major digital platforms and Australian media businesses concerning the terms on which platforms use content generated by those media businesses, which goes to the issue of how these media businesses can be fairly remunerated for the costs of producing this content. While the policy tool here is not copyright law, this stream of work certainly seeks to address one of the major underlying issues which is of concern to significant Australian rights holders. Let me touch on our agenda to support content industries, recognising that copyright is key to the income of Australian artists, musicians and the screen production sector, amongst many others. So here we're looking at copyright enforcement as well as how to strengthen copyright access. Part of this, of course, is the importance of measures to discourage copyright infringement and maintain the protections and incentives that copyright owners rely on. Our approach has been that enforcement measures, such as website blocking, should be pursued in parallel with work to create better ways to access affordable, lawful content. Annual surveys commissioned my, by my department indicate that online copyright infringement in Australia is declining. And we do think this reflects the rise of lawful means for people to access digital content at attractive price points as an alternative to going to pirate sites. And I've touched earlier on the role of the growth of the SVOD, Subscription Video On Demand, services in this context. But clearly the work on website blocking has also been important. We introduced legislation in 2015, we further strengthened that in 2018, making it easier for copyright owners to seek court injunctions, disabling access to overseas online locations, as well as the removal of infringing sites from search results. This gives copyright owners a way to get materials removed quickly minimising the impact on the livelihoods of creators. And under this scheme, 
over a thousand websites that infringe copyright have been blocked so far. That being said, it must be acknowledged that copyright piracy remains a significant issue and the enforcement settings need regular review to help combat this issue. So I conclude then with the observation that we have a continuing policy agenda in this space, reflecting the extraordinary rate of change in the content sector, very much associated with digitisation and the internet. There are strongly opposed views on many of these issues, in large measure due to the different economic interests and perspectives of different groups of stakeholders. I expect to have more to say in coming months about our next tranche of copyright reform measures, which, as I've indicated, will be reasonably targeted and defined. Thank you all in the sector for your engagement to date, and there'll be plenty more of that engagement in the months and years to come. Thank you very much.